Several years ago, my wife and I had the opportunity to visit the Oregon State Fair. <clears throat> Valerie, my secretary at the time, had a daughter who had several 4-H entries, so we went to support her. I always love the state fairs and the opportunity that we get to see uh, the broader um, uh, array of uh, things that are available to uh, view. My favorite areas of the fair are the booths that involve the environment. Things like water quality studies, geological surveys, BLM, and anything to do with wildlife studies. I'm always fascinated by that and I love to see those. Animal deprivation caused by predators and land destruction caused by beavers. Look at the pictures of the cattle growers or sheep growers sometime, but don't do it with something in your stomach. We stopped at the Oregon Fish and Wildlife booth where we met several very nice people. Among them was a young lady who we struck up a conversation with, which always leads to, so, what do you do? I always love that. I do that intentionally. The goal is to try to steer the conversation towards spiritual matters in order to find out what their need might be. It's a great way to open the door to speak to them about Jesus. And it's amazing when you're looking for it to see God open the door for those conversations. All of us should be looking for those God moments that he provides for us to speak to others of the hope that we have lying in our hearts. And that's where our conversation went with this young lady in uniform. She told us her story. She said she once uh, was once deeply passionate about her relationship with Jesus. In fact, she had been a missionary somewhere in India for a couple of years. She had been with the Assembly of God Church. She went thinking she was going to save the world for Jesus. When she got to the country, she expected to find it a place where people were unhappy with their stay in life. That really was not the case. Where they would be crying out in despair, needing genuine spiritual touch, and looking for her to her for the answer for their life. Instead, she found people that really didn't, weren't aware that they had any spiritual need. She found people who were really, quite honestly, content in their stay in life. They were very gracious and kind, and they did not look to have much real need at all. In fact, they told her they didn't have any spiritual need because really they were already very spiritual people. She said she met a really old and very nice, wise old man who was very kind to her. He pointed to a mountain off in the horizon and asked her to look at it, which she did. He said, you see, there is a journey from here to the top of that mountain. That journey is paved with many trails, but each trail that you may choose to take leads to the same top of that mountain. So too with religion, my dear. Every one of us is striving to reach the top of the mountain. We're all on different paths, but they all lead to the same place. They all lead to the top. Whatever path you take, you will eventually arrive at the same destination. For all paths lead to heaven. The young lady was so impressed with the old man's wisdom, she told me. She said, in that moment, I knew he was right. She said, I decided right then that it really does not matter what you believe or what religion you follow because there is no wrong religion. And ultimately, everyone in their own way will eventually arrive. She said, so I quit and I came home and studied to become a wildlife manager. After more conversation, we parted ways with me saying I would continue to pray for her. The concept of a mountain is a great analogy. It makes for a great illustration. But in reality, that's all it is. An illustration to make a point seem more true than it actually is. It's an analogy to make a point. The story of the mountain path is not a spiritual reality. 
When we're talking about religion or heaven or eternity or even final destination, it has absolutely nothing to do with our climbing a physical mountain. And besides, I would venture to say the elderly man had spent his lifetime in the lowland simply looking at the mountain. You know how I know that? Because I've climbed a few mountains. He probably had never really actually made the journey to the top of the mountain, or he would have known the truth about mountains and mountain climbing. Because if you really want to get factual about the mountain illustration he used, all mountain climbers know that the closer you get to the top, the less trails there actually are. And that when you get to the summit, that fine, narrow point at the very beginning, at the very top, when you get to the summit, on every mountain, everything narrows down to one single trail that leads to the summit. So much for an old Hindu analogy that easily breaks down with reality. But the girl we talked to had lost her faith in Jesus just the same through the experience, which was incredibly sad. I was reminded of that story just a little while after. I read uh, the title of a new up-and-coming book attempting to address this very troubling, ever more popular view we have in our society today. The book was entitled, All Roads Do Not Lead to Heaven. I thought that was pretty cool. I plan to read that book one day. We're currently in this season of Lent, these time of 40 days of prayer and fasting, these days 40 times prior to Easter, a time when we prepare ourselves for the greatest truth to ever touch the heart of persons. That the one true God loved all people enough to send his one and only son, Jesus, who knew no sin, to lay down his life as an offering to our Heavenly Father and pay the price of atonement. That's a biblical term. It means correctedness, to pay the price to make things right, making all things right between us and God for everyone who believes in the person and the work of Jesus. See, that's the criteria. And are looking at the Kingdom of Heaven theme for this year in our Lenten season, we must be confronted with the absolute truth that it is Jesus only. Jesus only. There is no other path. There is no other way. There is no other person that makes the path back to God but Jesus. When we go to the story of the life of Jesus found in the book of Matthew, we discover Jesus teaching his followers by questioning them about what they were hearing about him. What were others saying about Jesus? I think Jesus used this as a teaching point, as well as wanting his followers to make a declaration. It's found in Matthew chapter 16. You can follow along on the screen or turn in your Bibles on using NIV. And I read, When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? Now, please let me interject here for just a moment. Matthew, the writer of this gospel story, gospel means good news. Matthew, the writer, was writing to Jewish people. His purpose was to convince his people that Jesus was the Christ of the Old Testament that they knew very well, that Jesus was the promised Messiah, that according to the Old Testament prophecy, the Messiah would come as the incarnation, meaning the God-man, meaning God in human flesh. So Jesus refers to himself as the Son of Man, in that everyone hearing this who was Jewish would immediately know he was speaking of God's promise of their Redeemer, the one who would correct that broken path back to God. So with that said, Jesus asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man or himself is? They replied, some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets, reincarnated. Isn't that interesting? But what do you say? What about you? He said, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. 
Jesus replied, blessed are, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock, the proclamation of who Jesus is, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. He was working on a specific timeline here. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders and chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, shall this happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. And whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. Truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Father, we thank you for the reading of your word, and we thank you for the words of Jesus, and we thank you for the words of Peter. They are so foundational to our belief system. In this world in which we live, where everything and anything is embraced as truth, we ask that you open our hearts to see the absolute truth, the truth of your word, and that we might internalize it and embrace it and take it out into a world that needs to see Jesus. And for this, we'll thank you now and evermore. In Jesus' name, amen. Isn't it great? Peter nails it with Jesus. He comes to the most profound proclamation ever made by anyone ever when he tells Jesus who he says Jesus is. Then, almost in the same sentence, Peter blunders and misses the mission when he makes his statement that attempts to thwart the plans of God for Jesus. That's why I love Peter so much. He shows me what real people like myself are all about and that Jesus still loves us. We can say one thing that's so profound and people go, whoa, that's heavy. And then we can say something in the next sentence that they go, what? I love it that Jesus loves us. But what is really awesome here is that Jesus so honors Peter's statement about Jesus. That Jesus declares Jesus will build the church what we are today on Peter's announcement of who Jesus is. We are Christians, Christ followers, Jesus people, if you will, because of Peter's proclamation about who Jesus is. When asked, when was the last time you said, well, actually, I'm a follower of El Shaddai. I'm a follower of El Yon or Elohim or Jehovah or Yahweh. We don't say that. We say we're Christian. Or for that matter, when was the last time you said, when asked, I'm a Holy Spiritan. Or I'm a Sotiro I follow Soteriology or I'm a Soteriologist. That's the study of the Holy Spirit. We're Christians. We follow Jesus, the one and only, the Christ. So what can we take away from this lesson for us in this season of Lent? What can we tell those we love around us, our friends, our co-workers, our family members, our friends and family who have been, quite I, I might honestly say, duped into thinking that it really does not matter what you believe. What can we tell those we care about that might show them that all religions and all belief systems do not lead to heaven? 
First and foremost, the Bible is the basis for life. That's what we can show them. That's what we can communicate to them. The Bible only is the basis for life. It is not other books, other processes, other thinkings, or, other, or any other thing that gives a correct foundation for life. I've often said here, when we moved here, I was always amazed when I talked to people in the Bitterroot Valley and said, I'm a pastor. Not one of them ever has said to me, oh really, I have this burning question on my heart that I've always wanted to ask a pastor. Could you tell me? They never once have ever done that. Oh, you're a pastor. Well, you know what I think? And they go off into these really weird philosophies that I'm like, wow, seriously? The Bible is the basis for life, not all these other thinkings and things that we might come up with. Incidentally, since we, they have removed the Bible from the schoolroom and the Ten Commandments from the walls and prayer in the classrooms, look what has taken place in this country. We're so much better off, aren't we? Right. Separation of church and state was never intended to be the removal from church from the nation. We're still supposed to be one nation under the one true God. My landlord of our little log cabin back in 1986, that goes back a few days. I mentioned just the other day, I went to the drugstore, and the girl in front of me, they said, date of birth, and they, she said something like 5, 20, 2,000, 2,000, she's not even born yet. Oh, do the math, Jim, you're old. Wow. Well, my Lord, landlord of our little log cabin back in Tennessee in 1986 made it into national news when a, Jew, a Jewish family moved into the mountains of the Appalachian Mountains where we were living. The Jewish family, the father happened to be a lawyer, protested the start of each day of school beginning with prayer, especially in the name of Jesus. My landlord, Richard, was the teacher of that new Jewish boy. This family had moved into the Bible Belt, into the Appalachian Mountain culture. Now get this, because unlike Montana, these new people did not embrace the culture of the community. They tried to change it. Whoa, so glad that's not happening here. So they went to court to stop the corporate prayer in the school that had taken place for what? 200 years? At least 100 years in that community. We don't like this. We don't like this Jesus stuff. We want you to stop it. Separation of church and state. One new family trying to change a community to line up with their personal beliefs. I've written to senators very recently here, this last week. I called people. You would not believe the number of Senate bills that are in right now to try to change the systems that we all are a part of and are part of this culture for many years, dealing with hunting and trapping and fishing and everything. It's unbelievable. Right now, it's happening. I remember Richard telling me how he handled it. He said, I looked at the new boy with genuine love. Richard was a wonderful Christian man. He said, son, we would never want to do anything to embarrass or offend you, but we believe in Jesus. So before class, I'll allow you to go stand in the hall away from our class prayer until we're done. Then you can join us because we are going to pray together to begin our day in class. The national news all died down and went away because there wasn't any spectacularism to sell anymore. But that's how they handled it, and it worked well for everybody involved. It's been many years, but I can guarantee you that if you go to Roan Mountain, Tennessee today and go to that little elementary school where our boys attended, you'll find that they still pray to begin their class every day. I'll bet you would. I don't know for sure, but I bet you would. <clears throat> we believe in the teachings of the Bible, folks. The Bible is foundational and instructional for life. And it is without error. There's a movement to discredit the Bible saying it is written by a man and it is flawed and inaccurate in its suggestions. It was dictated to the hands of men, but it was written by God. 
for people. That's what we believe. The Bible may be sometimes difficult to understand, but the more you're in it, the more you comprehend and know and his plan, God, and you know God, his plan, and his son, Jesus. The Bible is absolute. It's absolute truth. I find it fascinating that history and science who are so often communicated as absolutes, science, oh, it's absolute. So quickly they fluctuate and change as new information is made available. I go to sleep by old-timey radio on podcast. That's how I try to get my mind shut down. Old westerns and old detective shows from the 30s. Sometimes I'll, I'll, sometime I'll have to bring in some of the commercials for you to listen to. Good science. Four out of five doctors recommend camel cigarettes. <laughs> Take the camel challenge for 30 days and see if you do not feel better and breathe better because it has cool, refreshing taste. So much for science. Yet so many things in science newly discovered point all the more to the factual truth about the Bible. Read biblical archaeology magazines sometime. It's fascinating the new stuff that they discover that goes back to the very truth that we've known all along. The Bible, in its truth, stands alone. In fact, it interprets itself. 66 books written over what, 2,000 years? Divinely inspired, God dictated to the human instrument to communicate his plan for his people. From the Old Testament and the covering of sin with the blood of the Lamb, to the New Testament removal of sin by the washing with the blood of Jesus, the Lamb. The entire Bible points to Jesus as the only way. If you will not consider the Bible, which is foundation to all that we believe and hold to, then there really is no argument or discussion. Because that's an absolute for us. Because the premise of all that we hold on to all that we hold on to is the Bible. So when you're wondering about another person's belief system, simply ask them what they believe about the Bible. That'll tell you a great deal about their path that they're attempting to climb to the top of the mountain. They may be seriously off track. They may actually be wandering down in Zigzag Canyon. You guys don't probably know about Zigzag Canyon. The first mountain my wife ever climbed was Mount Hood. Mount Hood loses lots of hikers every single year. There was a, a doctor that was rather wealthy in his family. He was lost on the mountain. His family said, we want his remains, his body to be found, and we'll pay a large sum of money to anyone who discovers it. Bring our husband, our father's body back. They went through Zigzag Canyon. They found nine bodies, but none of them were the doctor. You, there are people that are wandering around in Zigzag Canyon, lost, never to be found. Which brings us to the second point. It's the title of the message, but it's also a point that we need to emphasize. And that is that it is Jesus only. It is Jesus only. Peter, speaking about Jesus to the crowd in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, says... Salvation is found in no one else. Listen to me. It's not the Wesleyan Church. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Saved from sin and saved from ourselves. John 3.16, very familiar to most of us, God gave his one and only son, Jesus, that whoever believes in him alone will have eternal life. Read it. Study it. John 14, Jesus speaking, Believe in God, believe also in me, he says, because I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It is Jesus only. Jesus only. Jesus speaking in John 8, 24 says, 
For unless you believe that I am who I claim to be, you will die in your sins, separate from God for all eternity. The Bible makes it very clear. There is only one way to God in heaven, and that is the Jesus way. When I sat in a park bench in, on a park bench in Seattle with a, Muslim, with a Muslim woman attempting to explain to me that we really worship the same God, that, God, that Allah is simply God in Aramaic, that's what it means, and so I say Allah, you say God, we worship the same God. My th first thought as I listened to her was, then why don't you speak English or Hebrew and call him God? And why don't you use the Bible? instead of the Quran. But when she then told me, we are the same, except for one small thing. Our people reject Jesus as God's son. Then the discussion was finished because that one small thing, as she claimed it was, is the absolute everything to those who believe in the one true God and his plan for people. It's Jesus only. It's not Jehovah God only, it's Jesus only. That's what we believe, that's what we live by, and that's quite frankly what we'll die by. Jesus is our everything. So after you find out what the other person believes about the Bible, ask them what they do with Jesus, because that will tell you a lot of where they're at in their life. Because the foundation of all that we hold to is Jesus, Jesus alone is the way. Which leads us to our last point. Knowing Jesus makes all the difference. Knowing Jesus makes all the difference in the world. The challenge we have is that age-old challenge of how do you love the sinner and not accept the sin? You see, it's love the sinner, not the sin. When you discover for yourself to embrace the Bible as absolute truth, and then you discover what it says, that Jesus only is the only way. It's never with the intent of shoving the truth in the face of those who are wrong, or who are mistaken, or who are on the wrong path. That is never our intent. If they disagree with the foundation of the Bible and Jesus, think about it. They are lost to God. That should never, ever cause the Christ follower to walk away saying, ha, stupid lost person. Ha ha, I've got the answer for my life and you don't. Ha ha. I've never walked away from a Jehovah Witness saying, they don't hold to Jesus as the one and only son of God. Boy, are they stupid. I, walk away, I don't walk away from a conversation with a Muslim saying, what an idiot. And I don't walk away from the atheist saying, ha, huh, you wait, buddy, you'll find out. And I've had conversations with all of the above many times. I walk away with those, com those conversations. I walk into them praying for the right words, and I always walk away from them feeling inadequate and frustrated that I did not get through more of the truth of Jesus to them. And a girl raised by two atheists sitting on a bus next to me. She sat down and saw something I was doing, my Bible or something. She said, so are you a Christian? I said, no, I'm a sociologist. I said, yeah, I'm a Christian. I've always wanted to ask a Christian. I was raised by, my, both my parents are doctors, highly educated, and they're atheists. So I've grown up in an atheist home. Tell me the truth. And I had two hours to talk to this girl about the truth of who Jesus is and what it's like. And she said, boy, that's what I want for my life. What an awesome time. What an awesome time. I always walk away from those conversations a little frustrated. Our message is a message of love for those lost to God. Would you get that, please? Our message is a message of love for those who are lost to God. God cares to seek and save those who are lost through his son Jesus and through us. It's not a message of self-righteousness. 
And I praise God that when I was lost, I was an adult. When I was lost, Jesus' people did not treat me poorly and look at me with disgust and call me stupid, but they rather loved me. They were very attractive people, and I wanted to be like them because they were like Jesus. The Bible is absolute truth. Jesus is the only way. But when you know Jesus, really have a relationship with him, it makes all the difference in the world. It brings hope, and it brings peace, and it brings abundant life into your life. So I have to ask, you know, we're so bombarded all the time by all of these differing philosophies that are permeating our life on what we see on the television, what we read in the newspapers and magazines, and what we hear on our radios and podcasts. I have to ask you, have you settled it? Have you really settled it for yourself? Is it Jesus only for you? There's only one way to the top of the mountain. There's only one way to heaven. That's who God's plan of Jesus. He died for your sins. That's what the season we're in is all about. That you might live in belief of him. Have you settled it? Let's bow our heads for a moment of prayer. Think with me for a moment on your own personal belief systems. And if I were one-on-one -on -one with any of you, I'm sure I would hear differing ideas and different concepts. Some of you have been influenced by very positive things, absolutes. And some of you have been influenced by other belief systems. Are you embracing the Bible as truth for your life as you function from this day? You know, we've, we've faced several recent deaths in our communities that have really impacted us in thinking about the reality that life is so incredibly short. Ray Deakman's carpenter just passed away this last week. But to think of how incredibly short life is and to think are you embracing the Bible as absolute truth for your life? And then are you embracing Jesus as God's one and only way? And then are you receiving him into your life through a personal relationship with him? It's as simple as a prayer. All you have to do is say in your own words that you believe and that you accept Jesus. And when that happens, he takes your sin. It's transferred to him, and he gives you his eternal life. It's that simple. So let me pray with you. Father God, you sent your son Jesus as the one and only way. It's belief in him that paves the way, repairs the bridge, opens the door to our relationship with you, Lord, through your son, Jesus. We, in this very moment, during this Lenten season, embrace your word, the Bible, in its entirety. We don't understand it all, but we embrace it as absolute truth as it guides our life. It gives us foundational principles that are even good for community. And so we embrace it. And in the middle of all of the writings, we see permeated throughout them the truth of the person of Jesus Christ, your one and only Son, as our one and only way. So right now, we take Jesus into our heart. Some of us have done that before. That's okay. We receive Jesus into our heart and say we truly believe. He takes our sin and we receive his life. So thank you, God, for this Lenten season when we can look at the kingdom of heaven. How are we ever going to be a part of it? 
unless we embrace the person of Jesus. So help us from this point on. It's not the church. It's not even the church universal. It's Jesus and Jesus only. We receive Jesus into our life. And we thank you for that incredible gift you've given us. It's free. We just receive it. And you take away all of the wrong of our lives. And wash us whiter than snow. And for this we thank you. Today and always. In Jesus' name.